All right, so we are picking up in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. And as we begin this morning, I'd like to read a quote from one of the church fathers, the old church fathers, Augustine. And he said, If you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel, but you believe in yourself. As we look at the last few days, the last week, the, now we're getting into the, the last hours of what Jesus came to accomplish. It's important to understand that Jesus is really trying to make his message as clear as possible. Jesus, in this last week, as he's introducing in the book of Matthew the kingdom of heaven and talking about the need to be in that kingdom and that, that kingdom is a spiritual kingdom and that kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and it is a kingdom where he is the king and he will rule, rule and reign forever. And he tells us that we must be converted, we must be born again to get in that kingdom and he's explaining through the book of Matthew all the details about that and substantiating that he is truly the king of kings lord of lords and so now as we we get to this last week as he's ridden in in this last week on Palm Sunday we see all this activity so a lot of activity has been going on in this last week and if we can sum up all of this activity is Jesus is trying to make things very clear and in fact this morning we get into really his his last explanation his last teaching before he actually goes and does all the things that he's been teaching about so in this last week we can sort of look at he was trying to di uh, differentiate himself from all others and he was trying to differentiate his gospel from all other means that people would view as ways to eternal life he's differentiating the fact that there are those who message and those who come from heaven not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead he who eats this bread will live forever. So Jesus was saying that, and in, in John, in John records that in John 6. So now we get back to this scene, and Jesus has, has said, I'm, I'm this bread, I'm a metaphor, I'm a picture. As you understand bread, now take what you understand about bread and realize now I'm going to equate myself with this bread, but I'm going to do so in a way where I'm going to talk about myself in a spiritual sense that like the bread you eat, which gives life to your body, the bread that is me, if you eat of that bread, you will have eternal life. Now, as he's saying this, he says, take, eat, this is my body. This is important because what Jesus is saying is, we each individually have a personal responsibility to take and eat. The person sitting next to you cannot take and eat for you. Your parents, your family, your grandparents, whatever, they cannot. You yourself have to take and eat of the bread. And that's why each individual was given their portion, even though it came from the same loaf. So now what we're doing is powerfully transitioning into an explanation of what the gospel is is as they would understand the importance of bread now jesus is moving them from that understanding and saying as you see this bread know that i am this 
bread, but even more so, I'm the bread spiritually where if you eat of me, then you will have eternal life. And as they're passing us around, that would be something different. That would be something for them unusual. And what Jesus is doing is he's explaining the body and the blood of the Passover lamb. But now, in verse 27, now look what he says. So now, then, he took the cup. What was the cup? The cup would be wine with, mixed with water. It would be diluted wine. And in this tradition, there would be four cups that would be passed around. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7 give us the prescription for this passing of cups. Remember, this Passover meal has various elements all speaking to and pointing towards the true Passover lamb that would fulfill this. But see, in, in their mind, they're just thinking that all these elements remind them of that Passover out of Egypt where God rescued them. Now Jesus is getting their minds to understand that he is that Passover lamb. And so they had passed four cups around He's on the third cup at this point. And the third cup, according to Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7, that would be the cup of redemption. So they're passing this cup of redemption around. And Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. And they had already passed this bread around. And Jesus is saying, I'm the bread. And now he's saying, pass this cup of redemption around, which may be not familiar to us, but it would be very familiar to them. They'd be passing this cup of redemption around. But before that, he says, and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. So notice Jesus is the one who's distributing these elements. Jesus is the one who's initiating all of these things. Jesus is the one who's telling them what to do, but on their end, they still have a responsibility to obey and do what he's telling them to do. So he gave it to them, and then it says, as, as he's giving this cup around, they would be drinking out of one cup. They didn't have COVID back then. They'd pass this cup around, and they'd all be drinking of this one cup. And they would be, and Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. And then he says something different again. He said, the reason is for, look at verse 28, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So here's another transition. And here's what we see, 1,500 years of Passover feasts. Now Jesus is saying that bread and your understanding of that bread that's my body. That drink that you're drinking, that's my blood. And what he's saying is that I am the fulfillment of 1,500 years of all that you have been doing and thinking about and praising God. Now, I am the one that has come to fulfill all of that. Now, in verse 28, when he says, for this is the blood of my new covenant. So we have an old covenant, which was based on what people would do for God. Or how well people would follow what God would say, how well they would obey God. And that was the old covenant. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 tells us that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, its purpose was not to save, but its purpose was to teach. What did it teach? The purpose of the Old 
covenant, which if you and I did this, then God would do that. It was conditional. And that covenant was based on the individual and how well they were able to keep the Ten Commandments and, and the other things of the law. Now, what happened was, Jesus is making a clean break from that. And this is why this is so important. Jesus made a clean break from that by fully fulfilling that. What that means is, He did what we could not do. The problem that we can fall into is when we don't understand that there is a clean break from that performance-based righteousness. Because Jesus was the one who actually performed it. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, in Jesus' initial sermon and declaration of the kingdom of God, He would say, unless your righteousness would exceed that or be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. You, so, in other words, you had to perform better than the best performers of the law on the planet. And the people knew that they could not perform that well. The people felt like failures. They felt like this is too hard. I cannot be good enough. This is a burden. I'm hungry on the Sabbath and I want to eat a grain of wheat that's right there, but I can't eat it and I'm starving. My ox fell in a hole and he's dying. I can't get him out because it's the Sabbath. And the scribes and the Pharisees just kept putting more and more burdens on themselves, yet they themselves were not fulfilling the requirements of the law. And Jesus is coming in on this scene, and what he is saying is, I'm the guy that took and is going to take all of those commandments on myself. I'm doing it for you. It's no longer you who do it. In fact, the whole teaching of the Old Testament was to be a picture and a teaching that would teach us and demonstrate to us that we cannot be good enough. That we can never perform well enough. And that was the whole purpose of the commandments. It was a school teacher. Galatians 3.23, it was to show us that when you try to be good, to be right with God, it is a never-ending burden that you will have to carry yourself and you will never find relief from it. So imagine as Jesus is, is teaching them, I'm the bread now, I'm the cup, and when he, he's saying that, they're in a Passover meal and they just slaughtered a lamb. And as they slaughtered the lamb, at this time, blood would fill the valley of Kidron with lamb's blood because of all those lambs being killed at that one time. It would be a, a visual picture like you can't even imagine. And now Jesus is saying as they're passing this cup, which would remind them of that past lamb in the book of Exodus for us, that, that, that one lamb was slain and that blood that poured out is, is put on the doorpost, on the entrance of the house, and there, therefore they would be safe. So they're thinking about that. And they're seeing... The Kidron Valley just fill up with blood and on their table they have that perfect lamb, that innocent lamb that was killed and it's right there in front of them. And Jesus saying, 
I'm that guy. And what he's doing is he's, he's gathering in 1,500 years of Jewish pictures and Jewish illustrations and Jewish teaching. He's bringing that all forward, the idea of the sacrificial necessity for, uh, for covering of sin, a, a sacrifice, a shedding of blood, all those years of all those lambs sl slaughtered and killed and blood applied and, and Adam and Eve in the garden, not uh, a fig leaf not being sufficient. They had to kill an animal to cover themselves and, and the sacrificial systems and the Jewish religion. And, and Jesus is, is bringing all this together in himself. And, and as he does that, so imagine... Following Jesus, hearing him proclaim the kingdom of heaven, and in their minds still thinking in earthly terms, still thinking of setting up his kingdom on earth, of conquering the Roman Empire, of not having to be oppressed anymore, and just the opposite. Jesus is saying, like this cup, this is my blood. This is, this is blood that would be shed. This is such a, a radical notion that not only God would come into the world as a human being, so the, the uncaused creator of everything would come into the world, would lower himself so much that he would take on a human body. And why did he do that? Why couldn't he just have a magic wand whammy and say, whoever wants to go to heaven can go to heaven. The, the problem is he had to undo the fall. He had to undo what we messed up. He, he had to be perfect so he could be a sacrifice. And in that, that demonstrates to us how much he loves us. When we think about in Jesus saying here that this this blood, this cup that you're passing around, that's my blood. He's not saying this is my literal, literal blood, obviously. What he's saying is this is a metaphor to help you understand as you understand the necessity of shed blood. He's saying I'm bringing in a new covenant that doesn't depend on you, but it depends on me and what I do. And because now in the new covenant, he and God the Father have made a deal. And the deal is based on their arrangement, not on the arrangement between us and God, because we failed at that. Because we can't do that. Because all of God's righteousness, all that it tells us is that we're not righteous. And so as he says, this is the blood of my new covenant, what he is doing is, also reaching back to what he has said in many places in the Old Testament, but in particular in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, and Jeremiah verse, uh, chapter 32, verses 37 through 40. And what he's proclaiming, what the prophet Jeremiah is proclaiming is that there's going to be something different that's going to happen. It's going to come in the future. And what's going to happen is that my laws will be written on your minds and on your hearts. What the Old Testament looked forward to was that our heart of flesh, I'm sorry, a heart of stone would become a heart of flesh. What the Old Testament was saying what Jesus is fulfilling is he's going to make us actually brand new people. Remember the clean break we're talking about? When we come to Christ genuinely, when we present ourselves to him without qualifications and terms and just say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Something, something happens 
where we actually become what John chapter 3 says is we become born again. We're born spiritually. We're born into his kingdom. We're born with a new heart and a new mind. What's that new heart and new mind? Written on our minds and engraved on our new hearts is a desire and want to walk with God. It's a rewiring, if you will, or I should say better word of, it, of that is total transformation of our nature. And that new nature is this desire to want to surrender our will to God. Now, when we start talking about that, what we're doing is now we're like Jesus, we're starting to differentiate. Because throughout Jesus' ministry, he had hordes of people following him. And he also had hordes of people leaving him. You know why? Because when Jesus would start to talk truth, when he would start to talk about the necessity of laying down your life, of dying to yourself, of surrendering to God's will, people didn't want that. People want a gospel to where they are still in charge, making the rules, and adding a little God in on top of that. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a radical transformation that happens where we actually become new people. We're not the same person with a little religion. And anybody who's tried to follow God by sprinkling, sprinkling in a little religion will find that is the same old religion. It's the same thing. Same frustration, same rules. Many people, they, they have to be tempted into the church or following God by people saying, Christianity is really cool. You will be really cool if you follow Christ. And let me tell you, Christianity is the most uncool thing that is the world's ever known. It's very uncool. And you're going to have to lay down your desire to be cool. You know why? Peter says that we're, as followers of God, we're peculiar people. That doesn't sound cool. We're not citizens of earth. And because of that, the Bible says that the world is not going to love us. In fact, the Bible says, be very weary. Something's wrong if the whole world loves you and thinks you're cool. But see, this is what happens. This is why oftentimes there's not a clean break. This is why Je Jesus is trying to distinguish a true follower from a false follower. And in many of these instances that he's given us, there are people that were sort of following Jesus, but not to the point of laying down their life. And Jesus would speak to that often. Because he realized that that person is not truly born again. And so what Jesus is saying is, what I'm going to do through my blood, blood would be how you would ratify a covenant. Right? Any, any of you, when you're young, have a blood brother and you like put a little slit on your thumb and you like rub it with your buddy and say, we're like blood brothers. Did anybody do that? Is that just me? Don't do that now. It's, it's dangerous. But see, this, this covenant that God made, it was a blood covenant. And that blood covenant had to be by a perfect, unblemished lamb. But notice what when Jesus talks about this new covenant, something radical happens to the individual 
not Jesus, but the individual who participates in this agreement. So the question arises, how do we participate in this agreement? Because we're being shown that Jesus is saying that he's going to do this. And he's saying that he wants all to drink of this cup, which represents his own blood that would be shed to be the satisfaction or the propitiation of God's wrath. So he would take God's wrath on himself. But not all participate in that. And that is because God has placed the responsibility on each individual and each individual will stand before God individually to give account for what they did with Jesus Christ. And that's it. But see, something, something happens and, and I want to differentiate something here. And what I'd like to differentiate is the role of good works in our salvation. So we laid out, laid out the fact, I think, that good works will not get us into heaven. So why is that? Why is that? It's because the requirement of our good works are so high, how high are they? Their holiness, God's holiness is our standard. And the book of Romans describes it like this. The book of Romans calls it righteous requirements. And Matthew, in Matthew, he describes something that Jesus said, where he said it's, it's not just not murdering somebody, but it's actually the thoughts, if you think that way, if you lust after somebody, if you hate somebody, if you covet something somebody has, that's not holy. And, and Jesus was, was saying that there's no way for a human being to meet those righteous requirements. And that's why we need a Savior. So how do we actually involve ourselves in this new covenant? And that's laid out very simply for us in many places. One of the best is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says it's not by works that you're saved, but by grace. It is by grace that we are saved. What does that mean? It's, it's exactly what we're talking about. Jesus is doing it all. And the way we access what Jesus did is by faith. So that's what we do, that we access the wonders and the glories of heaven by an act of faith, which that act of faith has actually been given to us or the opportunity to respond because God even puts the measure of faith in us that then finally comes down to an individual's responsibility to respond to what God has done. So then the question is, where do good works come in? Is that even a thing? Good works are not a thing at all when it comes to our salvation. When it comes to what the Bible talks about justification or being made right with God. Zero works. Zero. Nothing we add. Nothing we bring. Zero to the table. But after we're saved... The demonstration, the proof of our salvation will be seen in our works. So 
we make that so complicated, but just think about it like, when it makes sense, if we're born again by faith, and God gives us a new mind, He gives us a new heart, it's always interesting to hear your stories. People will say, man, I used to be such a pothead, and then I gave my life to Christ, and after that, I tried it. I just, I wasn't into it anymore. I just, it just took that away from me. And there's hundreds of stories like that. All, all of you probably have stories like that. But it, something shifts. Because before, we were fleshly, carnal people, and we love stuff like that. We live for stuff like that. And we wouldn't have any godly conviction, really. It would be only sorrow when we got caught, mostly. Or if our life was being ruined. But see, when we become born again, it's so radical, the transformation that, that there's a, a change that goes in on, uh, that changes in our heart and our mind. So we may still sin, but we don't enjoy it and we feel terrible about it. Why? Because we're new people. So when we sin as believers, we're sinning against our nature. When we sin as non-believers, we're sinning with our nature. So good works are something that comes out of the believer in Christ naturally because we love to obey His commandments. That's one of the signs of our salvation that we want to do right we want to do good it blesses us it it, it gives us a, a a joy to know that we're walking in God's ways and so works are a factor after we're saved but those works that are a factor are just simply proof of our salvation and the proof of our salvation is not that just we do a good bunch of good stuff, but it's fruit coming from our inner relationship with God. Is the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, and we surrender our will to God, then what comes out is godly fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And sometimes, a lot of times, I'm actually surprised. When godly fruit comes out, out of me, it's like, I know it's not me. Like, where did that come from? That wasn't me. That must have been the Holy Spirit living in me. So what Jesus is saying, getting back to the text, what Jesus is saying is that there is going to be blood shed for the remission of sins, that He's going to do it, that this cup being passed around it is a picture of blood that is being shed. And like the bread, the cup that you drink, you actually have to take it in. And it actually will become a part of you. And as that happens, the Bible describes this as being born again. When you're born again, now your sins are completely done with. Why? Because Jesus himself paid for them. And when he paid for them, he didn't pay for some. He paid for, for all of your sins, all of my sins. The moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away. We are now white as snow, presentable to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's important to understand from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 and 26, that this was a one-time deal. There is not an ongoing payment for our sins. It was finished. The payment was accomplished at the cross once and for all. There's nothing else. And so all those who come to Jesus and receive his forgiveness have received his full and total pardon, never to be condemned again. Amen? Amen. And so... What does that all lead to? Let's finish off with this. What does that all lead to? The, the bread and the blood and Jesus picturing this thing that He's going to do for all those who 
believe. Then he says this in verse 29. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. So that water and wine mixture. He said, I'm not going to drink of that anymore from now on until that day. What is he saying? The Passover feast that they've been celebrating for 1,500 years that pointed to a Messiah, that pictured the Messiah, it's done. There, if, if you're Jewish and you'd still do the Passover feast, it's not authorized anymore. The Passover over feast which pointed to the Passover lamb was finished there, no more, done, because Jesus fulfilled it. And what Jesus is saying here. There's going to be a day. So now we're looking forward. What Jesus is saying is, because of, in his time, what I'm about to do, go to the cross, shed my blood, give my body for the sacrifice for your sin. And, and when I do that, then now because of that looking forward, there's going to come a day. And what's going to happen in that day? It says, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know what he's saying? He's saying that the past Passover, it pictured him coming. The present in Jesus' time was individual personal redemption. And what he's saying now is the Passover is talking about future glory. What he's saying is there's going to be a time where we enter into Jesus' kingdom that he will have on this earth for a thousand years. That will be called the marriage feast of the Lamb. And Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is saying there's going to be the biggest party you could ever imagine. It's going to last for a thousand years. And after that, it's never going to end. And all those who are in me will be part of this. And your future is secure in me because of what I did. And then, well, what would you do after all this? Do you hear that? What would you, what would you, if you're sitting there, what's the normal thing to do? Verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they sung a hymn. You know what hymn they sang? Go home and read it tonight. Psalm 118. Go read that. It's a Hallel psalm. And so Jesus is saying that, and he's basically saying this, this is the end of the Passover as you know it forever. I'm the Passover. I'm the new blood. I'm the new covenant. What you couldn't do before by being good, I've done for you. So the wrath of God does not abide on you. And you are redeemed and your salvation is secure for all eternity. So let's sing a song. Amen. It is finished. Let's rejoice. Let's thank God. Let's enjoy him. And then it says, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that's where Jesus is going to be taken and now the wheels are in motion for everything that Jesus said. This is his last teaching until the crucifixion. So as we finish up this morning, let's just put a little bow on it. And I want to say this in conclusion. The, the core of who we are as believers, is the gospel. And I, I really want to encourage you, this is really strong on my heart, how important it is to fully embrace the full forgiveness of Christ and His grace and to rid yourself of the thinking of performance, of earning, of merit, of what I have to do. But instead, because when we do that, we're not fully honoring God because of the gift that He's given us. So imagine somebody, Christmas coming up, you give them this Greek gift he thinks awesome, and they look at it and they don't open it, and they throw it in there, ah, it's all right. But see, the way we appreciate and enjoy the gift that God has given us 
is to walk in his grace. Peter said to grow in grace. And that means to continue to grow in the understanding of how good God is, how amazing he is, how high and lifted up he is, and, and to live in the understanding that all of our debt has been paid once and for all, and we never have to go back there anymore and visit, but now we are free to enjoy God and worship him forever. And that blesses God. So as we finish this morning, I pray and ask and encourage you to enjoy the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the price that he paid once and for all for your sins. You are free. You are forgiven. You have an eternity that is so amazing and grand. The blessed hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. And Lord, I want to pray first for anybody listening that today, as they hear these words, whether here or online, if you are not sure that you are going to heaven, if you are trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ for your salvation, if you are hung up on works and performance, I pray that today you would simply bow your knee to Jesus Christ, cry out to him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Wash away all that is not of you and write me in the Lamb's book of life. Do that today. Do that now. Don't mess around with your eternity. All you know for sure is that you have right now. That's all you know. So make sure you're using your right now to affect your there then. Do it now. And if you're a believer here today that the past year has given you so much reason to not be of this world. And I pray that if you're truly a believer, that you would now fully present yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Surrender your will to Him. And say, Lord, work out your salvation in me. Do it, Lord. Present yourself to him now. And let us worship the Lord now. Let's all stand. Let us worship the Lord. Let's thank him with everything that we have in our heart. He is so good. Let's worship him. God bless you guys.